Hello. Hope you can all hear me. This is Swap and Paul from Sydney Olympic Park Authority here in Sydney, Australia. I'm your host. You can say the moderator for this webinar session. And you are registered for the webinar session Essential Design Components for Urban Constructed Wetlands. And the presenter is Geraldine Dalby Ball. Good morning, or good afternoon, or wherever you are in this um, in various parts of the world. I know you have joined us from many, many parts of the world, Northern Hemisphere, Southern, and then right and left. Welcome to this webinar session. First of all, let me acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are running this program. We pay my respect to the elders of the past and present, and then also the emerging. So our speaker today is Geraldine Dalby Ball. Some of you might know her as Mia Dalby Ball as well. I hope Mia doesn't mind me calling her Mia. Oh, and this, great. So this session we are running as a partnership with SWS Oceania chapter and of course Mia's company which is Kingfisher Urban Wetlands and Ecology which is based here in Sydney. Just a few, few housekeeping in terms of the webinar session. Soon I'll hand over to her and she will be giving the presentation towards the end. I'll be skimming through some of the questions you might have, and then I'll request Mia to address some of the questions. If because of time shortage, we can't attend all the questions, I'll try my best to circulate the questions to all the participants. In terms of the recording, the recording will be available through Sydney Olympic Park Authority webpage which will not happen straight away. It will take a few days to populate it on the web page, and I'll let you know when it is ready. Mia, just a few words about her. She has been a technical advisor to the Sydney Olympic Park Authority's Wetland Education and Training, which popularly known as WET program a program that has been running since 2002. And over the years, we have run more than 50 wetland courses for wetland practitioners, enthusiasts, managers, and basically those who love wetlands. And Mia has been instrumental in organizing, in, in, in advising, and in running a number of courses. She is perhaps one of the most hands-on wetland person I have ever met. She's a scientist on one hand, on the other hand, she's a manager, she's a worker, she's a mentor and, and whatnot. And I know she has got some private hobbies following the lunar cycle for various things. I don't want to go to that, but I'm sure she does find some connections with the wetlands to do with the lunar cycle. So leave that to aside. In terms of the, the webinar today, this subject is really, really very important. Important also because in the context of global wetland losses, more than 40% of the wetlands have been lost over the millennia. And increasingly we see more wetlands or water bodies mainly for stormwater management have been constructed in the cities and towns. Not necessarily knowing as wetlands, but as a water body for various purposes, including aesthetic, biodiversity, and others. In technical terms, those are wetlands. So I'll leave it to Mia to take it further. And I encourage you to, to stick to the the presentation, and I'm sure you will all love it. 
To that note, let me now hand over to Mia. Hello, Mia. Yes, now I, I have clicked the button that says show my screen, so hopefully that's what's coming up for everybody. Yes, I can see the screen, so please Fantastic. go on. Fantastic, we will start. So today, I, I appreciate that introduction, Swapin, and it's nice to also to know that that's a reflection as well of you in terms of a person who actually gets into wetlands. Now, today is rainy, we're um, three quarters of the way through a moon, so the next one's a new moon. And knowing these things, not only are we more in touch with the natural cycles, but as wetland managers, I really think it's essential. And in that, I also acknowledge Jeff Sainty, who is a great mentor, who whenever it was raining and high tide said, we better go and get out there, even if it's 2 a.m. So a key part of this part of essential design components of urban constructed wetlands is knowing them, feeling them, breathing them, getting into them. And in Sydney today, it's wonderfully wet, and I will make sure I get outside and head down to the local stormwater drains and see what is happening. I'd also like to just say, wherever you are, anytime, to be the best, not only a wetland practitioner, but anything, particularly when it comes to management, is that ability to be in the present moment and to take other people there as well. So many of the design components are done from an office. So I highly encourage getting outside. And there's just a picture for some inspiration about being outside. Very importantly, I acknowledge the traditional elders and custodians of all lands of this beautiful planet we call Earth. Our indigenous people have tremendous wisdom that goes past, well, well past, um, Sometimes what we see is, you know, what our rain, rain gauges give us. You know, we'll say we've got 50 years of data or 100 years of data. How about listening with your people and learning about tens of thousands and more years of data? This really gives us a wider perspective when we manage, particularly managing into changing climates. And part of what I'll be touching on today is that the design components that we'll talk about are more essential now to do well because in changing climatic conditions, we have greater intensity of everything that's already there. And again, our traditional peoples can tell us, for example, here in, in Australia and in Sydney, the traditional people will tell us that the sea used to be two weeks walk further to the east. There's really good information about sea level, all sorts of things. Who am I? We've already covered that. The key thing on this slide is really to say, more importantly, who are you? And to ask yourself throughout this presentation how you can implement this. And also, if you know things in more detail that you can add as a group of people interested in wetlands, please always um, share, send some comments to swap and share them around. What makes a wetland? So I thought before we start, just very briefly, what are we talking about with wetlands? Today's focus is urban wetlands, but this will of course be able to include hanging swamps, um, rain gardens, any of those things where we um, hold and treat water. And speaking of water, we will look at those essential design criteria, and most of it's going to be presented through case studies. So I've got a number of examples here, and through that we will look at what we can do to discuss the essential design features with examples and of course the importance of linking urban wetlands with nature. The aim as well is to inspire. Now I really like this definition, the word inspire actually means to breathe or to fill with effect or a specific feeling. As we manage wetlands, as we create wetlands, as we design wetlands, a key thing is that we're going to have to have engagement and interaction and understanding in their maintenance because a wetland is pretty much, the design is essential, but the maintenance is, you know, it, it just has to happen. Wetlands, even really well designed that aren't maintained, are problematic. Even like a wonderful car, you don't look after it, things happen. The other thing I've noticed in wetlands is those that go really well in the longer term are those that are that are put together 
with their surroundings, of course catchment, but to see the wetland, knowing that whatever wetland you can put back or look after will assist in the much bigger picture of the area. You may have heard death by a thousand cuts in loss of environment, then we can see wetlands as bringing life back in a thousand pieces. So these are part of those essential pieces in urban places. I have mentioned climate change. So while I'm not going to do a lot about this in this particular presentation, I do note that the design criteria that we'll be talking about in terms of wetlands all take into account changing climate. And these will be things like the quantity of water, the frequency of water, the intensity, so the velocity, um, duration, extremes, pests, weeds, all those normal things but what does it mean for wetland design? That they will be exacerbated. Our dry times may be drier, our wet times may be wetter. So in this case, we need to be looking forward to design rather than looking on a book that may have produced our design principles 10 or 15 years ago. And as I said, get out into it. I can't stress that enough. We'll be talking a lot about water. So I just want to put that word up for a moment, but hydrology comes from the Greek hydor, meaning water and logos study. So hydrology is just the study of water. And what we're really looking at in terms of wetland design is the movement, the distribution, and the management of water. So how it moves across the surface, how does it come through the catchment, how does it infiltrate, um, and also importantly, very importantly, subsurface movement. Now I know there's a lot more a lot more that needs to happen globally and is happening in terms of groundwater. So groundwater is, let's say, over the last decade, it started to be something on people's minds. But how do our urban wetlands influence and interface groundwater? We've known that for longer, but more as a problematic thing. We don't want our urban wetlands interfacing groundwater. So it's certainly uh, something that we will be talking about moving forward because as dry times come, there is more uh, desire to seek aquifers and other subsurface water to top up our urban use. So how does that tie in then with wetlands that could possibly be part of the cleaning and filtrating process, plus the process of giving that precious water back to our groundwater resources. And of course, there's evaporation. So we'll look at um, design components that can assist with minimizing evaporation. Now, urban wetlands. It is so important and cannot be ignored that aesthetics are really key. What does the word mean? Derived from Greek, meaning a sense of perception. So often management is, is driven by aesthetics. It looks bad. And for those of you who know that wonderful bright green um, global plant called duckweed or and some of the others, we've got other water ferns, cortisola, but things like duckweed, which is lemna, and there are a number of species, very small, green, leafed, floating plant. And people will see it and say, ooh, the, the, wet, the wetland's gone off. You know, whereas if there was an education that it, it's actually an expression letting us know what's in the water, there's elevated nutrients, it's taking them out, it's photosynthesizing. All those good things. So the storyline that goes with how we reach out to people is quite essential so that we can influence a person's sense of perception. It doesn't mean it has to look beautiful. It means in their perception that they can perceive it as beautiful. Now the next five slides are a very quick flip through of urban and I'm still going to call them urban wetlands because we do construct wetlands that have sea grasses, mangroves, salt marsh, open water wetlands, which are the most common in the freshwater scenarios and urban places, and our forested wetlands. And then right into our urban places, we also have micro wetlands. And these are more and more important as people move into high rise buildings and the space on the ground gets less. It's back to that principle of a thousand pieces. You know, how do we have these little places that so recharge groundwater, provide aesthetics, provide amenity. They have the ability to collect stormwater 
in small patches over a very wide area rather than the old model of collect from the whole catchment and divert it into one. So we start to look at the landscape more like a body with different receptors areas with kidneys for cleaning. There are multiple places and multiple touch points. And then we can engage our local community in small scale maintenance as well. So mini, these mini or micro wetlands, they do occur, but it hasn't really come up in the you know, major design principles. That, and so you can still get these really shocking things that end up being a, a weedy mess that the mowing people say they can't mow the grass in and the mosquitoes proliferate. So again, whatever size our wetland, the engagement with community is essential and the design so that they produce more good than bad. We don't want um, an anoxic, meaning no oxygen, wet mess of mosquitoes and long weeds. Even though it's great for some species, that's not our design. I know this is a list, <laughs> but this list will just rattle through it. And then what we're going to do is as we go through the case studies, we're going to look at each of these. And I will, as gently as possible, point out what I all too frequently see, uh, particularly in terms of water level control and what we can do about it. It's not meant to be this is all bad, but I'll definitely say these are things that I've seen when I go back to wetlands um, five, ten years later, or even when it's been that a wetland has been constructed as part of a development and is about to be handed over to um, local government, for example, or the um, body corporate of homes that are then going to have the residents care for this, and it fails, and it fails on very predictable things. So it would be fantastic if this information made good design so we don't have those failures. People do it once, do it right. I know the universe still happens. You can have a massive rain event, for example. However, this is one thing that we can do. We can get it right the first time and then deal with the randomness. So treatment train. Many of you would know what this means. It just means there's a whole process of things that need to happen. Let's have them acknowledged and that they're not all in one puddle. Yes, we take off the sediment. Yes, we take off the large pollutants, rubbish and things. Yes, we have that ability to um, aerate, for example, that can be part of it in some urban wetlands I'm working on now. There's sophisticated ultraviolet uh, sterilizing places that are also the water is going through. So it can be everything from very simple, gross movement of material. So your wetland only gets what's desired. Or it can be the very high tech, as I mentioned, UV treatment and other on similar levels of, of cleanliness. The next one, online, offline, this comes up so, so frequently. And it's usually the outcome is not best for the wetlands or wetland management, but it is a byproduct of land being, uh, I'll use the word expensive, but we could say land being highly desirable for many uses. So what inline means or online, is that the stormwater comes down inside the waterway and then the wetland is inside that same waterway. Now there are so, so many reasons why that is absolutely not the best design at all. And you'll just logically know them, so I don't need to go through a lot now. We'll look at the pictures. Offline is more like in Australia, we have billabongs, which is, we call them billabongs. Now they're in all river systems where your river winds around like a snake and then sometimes the big loop comes offline. Now in a high flow, you get some of the water, most of the water still charging straight ahead, but some water will come around the edge. So this is that ability to say how much water, we can control the amount of water to go through that offline wetland. So that's the wetland that sits to the edge of the main flow. That is really good for so many reasons. But obviously, it does take up extra space because it's outside of the creek line itself. Another aspect of that is quite often in um, planning, when you're working, for example, in Australia in the legislation, they require any stormwater treatment devices to be outside of the riparian zone. Now, the riparian zone um, is classed as that land that's from the top of the bank of the water and then a set number of 
you know, meters back or feet back. So, for example, if it's a small creek, it might be 10 meters back as riparian. A large creek would be 40 meters back as riparian. The first half of that, or often all of that, is where the agency say you, you're not to put stormwater treatment. But what that, which which is great for you know the trees and the you know having that large um, continuity of vegetation. But what it also does is it it does um, reduce the opportunities for people designing offline wetlands to sit just next to the main flow. So that's something we work with. We can always get outcomes, but that would be a better design to get offline. Now, the big one, I should have had this in bold, water level control. And I'll save it for the next slide and for when we're going through the case studies. Um, another one, ability to isolate the cells. That means you have different pieces of wetlands and you can shut some off. The area relative to the catchment. If you have a huge catchment and a tiny wetland, and as I said, sometimes this is all you have. And when you do, we'll work out how to make that still viable. Catchment condition, how much silt. Also, what type of silt. I've often had um, the wetlands are designed and there's not, there's not a consideration of the soil type. Now, this, this can be you know, a, a very big deal because even in how we treat the sides of the wetland, the batters that are going to be planted, if you've got what's called a sodic soil or a dispersive soil, once it gets wet, it chemically breaks down. That's very different in terms of managing that compared to a soil that's stable chemically but will physically move. So the other aspect is salinity. I've worked on projects coming late, beautiful wetland designed, lots of plants, lovely, all dying. Salinity. So knowing your catchment can save and I'm only saying this because it does happen. It sounds obvious, but it does happen. It wastes money and time. So salinity as well as your catchment. Retention. Retention times talked about a lot with the assumption that the longer the water sits in the wetland, the cleaner it is. Well, that's okay as, a, as an assumption, but as you can imagine, if you left your water in your bath for a long time, it wouldn't get any cleaner. It would certainly get quite revolting. So um, we do need to say retention time in a functioning wetland where the water is moving. Speaking of moving, velocity. Now we mentioned that briefly in online versus offline. The online wetlands will need to be able to cope with whatever velocity comes down that waterway. Offline we can manage it better and divert high velocity water. That will have a big influence on what we can put in place, uh, what cleaning capacity we have and also how well we can maintain it. Plants and biofilms um, this is one, it almost needs its own talk, really. Uh, with some amazing videos, even, I could see being created for this because so much of what happens with plants is, in terms of cleaning water, is contributed, really, to a wonderful mix, including a lot of bacteria that create a slime or a mucus on the outside of the plants. And it's that that the very fine sediments uh, stick onto and then that sinks to the bottom because it gets heavy. And then that's where it can be changed, um, moved into anaerobic conditions when it's you know, right underneath things and then you can have the nitrogen being taken out, all those processes. But first we have to get the material out of the water and into the sediment. And it's the biofilms that play such a large role. I mentioned water level control would be done by itself. I'm not even going to read all these things here. I'm just going to say there are ways to do it that enable long-term maintenance and short-term maintenance to go well. And it's the thing that I see done most poorly in all designs. And it's not hard. Uh, and I'm always open to listening and seeing new techniques. And really my input here comes from going and looking at wetlands. Uh, that very simple structure we, we can see in the bottom of the picture is called a drop board structure. It's literally that. I should have taken photos of more of the, the boards, but in essence, it just has boards that are about 10 centimetres high each and they fit down the slots in the middle of that concrete, one on top of each other. And uh, the red thing that you can see is the bar that you can use just to pull them out. Now, the bottom of that um, pit that's being looked into has an opening, one to water coming in 
and one water going out. So if you want your water coming in to just flow straight into your wetland, you could take out all of those boards. If you wanted only 10 centimetres of water to come in, you could just move all the boards up and leave the bottom 10 centimetres available. You could push all the boards down and keep all the water in the second part. It's so easy. I don't, you, know, you just imagine that you've got these boards so you can set the water level. The importance of this relative to other designs, such as there's quite a few designs that look really fancy that are about you know, turning, turning, turning a structure that's like opening a gate. Now the thing is, you have to stand at that gate until the water reaches the water level that's the design level. Once it has reached that level, then you turn the gate off. Now, who's going to stand out there themselves for hours or pay staff to go and be there standing up for hours waiting for the water level to get to that height? So these are the things that I mentioned. Sometimes it looks really good on paper. Hey, we'll just open it up and when it's the right, we can shut it. But practically, that it's just not practical. It doesn't work. Um, so. In essence, set and forget. So if you think of a structure that you could put the boards in and that would set it, and then you can walk away. When I say forget, obviously we don't want to forget them, but drop boards are very effective. Now, I did mention mosquito management on the other one. There is a fantastic person called Cameron Webb who will give you so much information on mosquitoes. Uh, my key message is when you put in all the other design criteria well that we're going through in this presentation it will be much easier to manage mosquitoes that's just a fact of how it is if you have water level control you can manage it if you have the ability to circulate water you can manage it if you have the um, a, a mix of plants now it can be said that some wetland designs absolutely mean more mosquito habitat and that could be things like um, very slow flowing to very slow flowing water which is shallow with a rich organic base um, and quite densely vegetated. That's beautiful mosquito habitat. It's also wonderful frog habitat and really good wetland habitat and nice for settling sediments out. So we, I'm not going to say that there's a design that totally gets rid of mosquitoes but what we look at is mosquito management. And then how do we maximise the ability to manage while minimising their habitat? So here's an example. As I said, we'll go through actual examples based on images. Uh, here's an example of a wetland that was designed to treat uh, stormwater from a very large residential area that's being moved in. It also happened to be a place that had green and golden bell frogs. So that's an endangered species in the Sydney area. Those of you familiar with Sydney Olympic Park will know that's one of the flagship places with um, very good populations of green and golden bell frogs. So what we're looking at in the, the bottom left-hand corner is a green and golden bell frog habitat creation prior to planting. The big expanse is the urban wetland. And what I want to point out here is the rock berms and what that allows is it just pushes the water. It, it's slow moving water, but it definitely has to move around. So it increases the surface area, increases the time the water tanks to move through this system. And uh, this is uh, the same well, a week later after it's been planted. I've been back since and you can't see anything because the plants are so huge. So that's an example there showing berms. The other thing about this is in this picture, what it's showing is each cell of the wetland. So instead of being one big wetland, it has complete dividers. So if need be, this wetland here could be totally separated from that one. Through here are drop boards, like what we were just talking about, where you could lift them out or push them in. So that enables, for example, if there was um, a problem weed or a problem fish, you could bypass the water that's coming in through stormwater and have it enter this second piece. You could drain and dry this section out completely. So that ability to bypass the cell gives you complete, not only complete management capacity, 
but it also allows wetlands to go well, particularly wetlands that are in climates that would normally have some period of dry. I've been to wetlands that have been said to be failing, and then when we actually look at it, it's more that there hasn't been any variation in water level. And as soon as it's drained, the plants grow themselves. So that's just a case of managing the birds, not to eat the plants. Um, this, is those, this is one of those frogs that got out of its um, entrapped little area and came right to the, we can see where the people are planting the plants, right to it and, and had a look. So let's build it and, and they will come. When you create these natural places, um, nature really is, is wonderfully resilient in many, in many cases. We won't say always, but in many cases. So an example of a stormwater wetland. Here's one that's actually built as part of an urban space. And you can see during the development, it's fine that it's full of sediment. That's what it's designed for. And then it's planted. It's densely vegetated. It's still going very well. This again has separate cells. It has water level control and the ability to be maintained. A nice thing is, even though this is in an urban space and um, isolated from other places, it has a fantastic array of invertebrates that are all part of that system. So they've come in with plants. We then have a little example of a salt marsh creation. And again, when we look at ecosystems that have been heavily impacted by urban expansion, the loss of salt marshes is a key one. And for those of you working in this area, you'll know very well that importance of the salt marsh as a place, particularly for crabs. And again, this is applicable globally. Crabs then release larvae to the waterways, those larvae are essential fish food. So apart from how intrinsically lovely salt marshes are, here we see the example at the top where it was um, excess to the playing fields. It was just back in the day when things were filled and turfed because that was what was aesthetically appreciated to being excavated, keeping as many of the trees as possible. And now this is just after being built and planted. And um, now this is showing park tide. So the whole thing is about getting the, the tide right and not having isolated pools. So this salt marsh has worked really well. Uh, another one, you can create a wetland. We've mentioned this thing about inline. If you have to have your wetland in line, meaning it's in the stormwater flow, what you can do and what happened in this wetland um, is this is the direction of flow right down the middle. However, under the water here, there is a wall which has the drop board structure in it. So you can move water from one side to the other if you need. This side here is quite heavily designed. It has storm water, it has sandstone. It's able to cope with the velocities. So the water, the, the normal high flow bypasses come down here and they have their own um, exit device here, their own water level control there. And on this side, we have, so at the top, there's a device here that moves some of the low flows onto this side. So we can choose how much water comes down here. The top of this wetland is a very dense marsh, but the community really wanted the vista of open water. That was a main design criteria here. So through the division of really making it two wetlands, high flow on this side and low flow on that side and the wall being underwater, it's made it look like one piece. And then yes, this has a separate water level control device on this side as well, so that this side can be independently drained and planted and the, the levels kept low during planting, which is what happened. So for 18 months, this side was quite well managed to keep the water levels low for the plants to grow while the high flows just came down here every rain event. We have another one called Wangle Park. Um, and this case study here, um, the wetland was designed principally by a company called Alluvium. We did a lot of input for the ecology, plant species, and again, the aesthetics, you know, how do people interact with this? So a lot of habitat features in this one and the use of native plants. So I mentioned that aesthetic. So that example I gave previously allows for the long views and reflections. There are so many cases when our urban wetlands, they are key criteria. How can we have lovely reflections, long views? That's one of the ways, as I mentioned. 
behind the dividing. Then we can have uh, engaging stories. Never underestimate the power of the artwork. So again, in many, many cultures, turtles are really important and symbolic of wonderful things, including you know, a gift for the birth of a child. So if we can include um, turtles in the shape of rocks, that we educate that we don't have exotic turtles released into our wetlands, there's a whole part of that component. Now, when I've said maintenance can be art, I don't have a photo in this presentation, but I'll describe it briefly. There's a wetland that was that has a really good bypass for the high flows to come down. However, it's a nice concrete flat piece that sits above the water. And it's a total favoured place for um, wetland birds to sit. And all they do, but not all they do, but a key thing they do when they sit is poo. And poo and poo and poo and poo and poo. And now that wetland has worse quality water coming out of it than what goes into it. This is predictable. It's one of those things that I mentioned is in the top five. Don't do things. Yes, encourage birds at the right level, but don't create structures that encourage them to sit and poo right into your wetland. So maintenance can be art. In this case, the design component could include um, not ugly spikes, but sculptural elements, something that's put onto that wall if the wall has to sit above the water, that is able to um, dissuade birds from sitting there. So just think, think that next level. Think. When, when it's in place, not just about the water. Um, of course, yeah, pest species, algae, smell, all of those are aesthetic design considerations, but we cover them in, in the design itself. Now, algae, algae will happen anywhere in an urban wetland if we, something has to take up the nutrients. So if something's going to take up the nutrients, it's more likely to be algae if there's nothing else there. Case study, Sydney Park Wetlands. This is a before picture. It's quite nice. This is an after picture. So the aesthetics was a very big part of it. This was a, a very costly project. It's won many international awards. The key component of this is it now taps into the stormwater. So from Sydney itself, it's very urban surrounding this. The stormwater comes in, moves through wetlands, including open water ones and bias whales and is recirculated through the area. But a key element was making it people friendly as well as wildlife friendly. We have swans and wonderful animals, turtles in here, and we have fencing that's been hidden inside the vegetation so that the dogs stay out of these areas while they are able to have access to these ones. So more and more as our urban areas get um, compressed, these parklands, are going to have to be multi-use. So that's a good example of multi-use. I know biofiltration is seen as a, a common solution quite often, but I wanted to put this picture in just to talk about some of the things that go wrong. I'm not going to say I don't like them, I do like them, and say so things need to be done well. Most cases when I am looking at a biofiltration system, it's because it's failed. The key failures are that they're they're put online too early. That means they're planted out and ready to go when the rest of the catchment is still being built. Just leave them as places to collect dirty water until you've finished everything else in your catchment. If you're doing a housing estate, leave them. Make them the very last thing. The fine sediment entering these, they don't work. It's that simple. Then to get an excavator in and to empty this just messes things up. You can rip the lining. You can, it really relies on these layers. Now, the layers are wonderful. It's copying nature. However, it's very hard to maintain. So if you don't need to do a biofiltration, if you can do something else, do something else, unless you've got the money to make sure the silt doesn't get in to begin with and to make sure you can maintain it. So in that case, often small is beautiful. You can do small individual cells and look after them relative to a great big one because I've been involved in great big ones that have gone wrong and I'm called in later to say what's happened, the plants are dying, or there's algae all over the top, or there's mosquitoes, and it's just the sediment is full. It's so common. So, as I mentioned, it copies nature. You've got the different size material at each part, and it does drain through wonderfully. In theory, it ends up in the pipe and comes out of clean water at the bottom. 
So worth having a look at, but definitely think of maintenance every time you do these. Quick one to waterways, because we're not really talking about waterways, it is more about wetlands. But the, the key message here in terms of design is velocity and soil type. That's probably all I need to say. It's just, again, I've seen failed examples because velocity wasn't taken into account, nor was soil type. This one, we have um, some dispersive soils through here, and where they put the jute mat, it just sunk completely, and the plants you know, are hanging in nothing, and their, their roots are exposed and they die. You know, it can be fixed, but where you've got really high velocity, this is an example of what's holding it in place, and then these sides are planted, and this is that same site sometime later. So it can work. But design, know your soil type, know your velocity. In terms of designing wetlands, knowing the water plants is key. So again, I get called in because a wetland hasn't been um, approved when it's been handed over because it's got no plants. Well, I look at the plants and they're all the favourite ones for the birds. So of course they've been gobbled up. It's as simple as that. Just going to a book and reading what's the name of the plant that goes well in this area doesn't give you the outcome. So please talk to someone who, who does it a lot. Um, you know, most people will be happy to, you know, I've, I've got lists of different plants for different places to say what's robust and what's not. If you have a place that you can keep beautiful, I strongly suggest you find some of your floating ones. These are all Australian floating um, native water lilies, including this one, Nardu, which is a traditional bush tucker. So again, we can now start moving towards bringing in and acknowledging the long stories and connection to the plants of the place. Edges. Now, plants like this, really nice, but if that was by itself in an open water, the swamp ends would chew that all up. That's called Mucronatus, lovely plant, Xenoplectus mucronatus. Um, we have, and again, as I mentioned, there's plenty of places we can give you all the, the different plant types, but knowing your, your plants as well in terms of how do you situate them so that you can maximise habitat? So we have knowledge of things like what do the dragonflies need, all sorts of things, and they can be incorporated. One thing that's often forgotten around wetlands is butterflies. Now, if you can get your butterflies into that edge vegetation, you can really bring something to an urban space because quite often our urban wetlands are all we have. So in your design components, I've got information there, and of course you can have access to this, but information about what themes butterflies tend to use. And of course, wherever you are in the world, you'll have a different set of requirements. Also to get that diversity, even if you can't put all the plants in that are the high diversity straight away, remember we do have wet edge species that you won't find in nurseries, you will need to design it in, but it's worth doing, even if it gets added two or five years later when the wetland's stable. Let's bring these places back. We have the insect eating um, drosseries we have. Yes, that's the flower of that one. So you know, we have, this is one called a bottle brush. It's a swampy, loving species. Now I mentioned the damselflies and dragonflies. Um, they're in the family Odonata, which means toothed ones. Again, this is part of connecting people with their urban waterways. So in your design, keep them in there. We've got common um, wetland plants like Garnia. There's a particular butterfly that only lives on the Garnia. So again, the more you know these stories and connections, the more you can bring them into your designs. Wildlife carers often need places to rehome animals in urban spaces. And the urban wetlands are going to be some of the key places to let their, especially lizards out. So in your wetland design, include places for them. Quite easy, logs, terracotta pipes, rocks, and keep them away from dogs, or keep dogs away from them. Uh, native bees, I just, sorry, I skipped over that one, but that's just a little inspiration. The native bees is, is a key part of this part. So that's all the terrestrial part around the edge. Again, wetlands naturally are a key place, so include those in your design. Uh, the plants themselves are a key part of the habitat. Design considerations for plants, let me touch on this because, as I mentioned, the wrong plants in the wrong place mean wetland failure. So just to recap quickly, water level control, really important. 
having your wetland as offline as possible, very important. Choosing the correct species. Now, again, there's a lot to learn in whatever country you're in in the world. There will be people who do know it, but above everything else, keep looking at the wetlands to see what works where. Have a look. In Australia, one of our key things that impacts our wetlands that have been designed well are birds. One particular species, the swamp hen. So knowing that, we can then choose other plants. And we do have another two plants. One's called Cladium and one's called Leperonium. The swamp hens do not like it. I very rarely see it on people's wetland designs. I put it on all the time because I go and look to see what makes it fail. So when you know it, you can start asking the nurseries for it. They'll start growing it and making it available. So find out what plants are real survivors in your area and um, incorporate those. And sometimes people didn't like cladium and leperonia because it grows tall, up to two metres. So again, now we're conflicting with that idea of open water vistas. The key thing is to be a good educator so that when we talked about aesthetics in the beginning, it was a perception. So how do we then change the perception that people really love the look of that plant and they can see the small birds in there eating the seeds and everything else that comes with the story of the plant. So as much as anything, if you're a good educator, you can get good design. I put that picture in before, it's just lovely. So that was just an example of those um, connecting people through stories because they like the look of those. Um, I did say the problem bird swamp hen, you may need to net. You may need to net whether it's a floating wetland or planting straight into substrate. This was a wetland actually that had supposedly failed, but it was just that the high flow bypass was never connected properly. So the plants were always being shot out. So six years later, we were asked to come in to find out why it wasn't working. We found that, we drained the wetland, and just in the draining, so many plants came up by themselves. But as we predicted, the birds came in, was chewing everything up. So we put the cages on, the plants came up really well. And you know, since then, the, the nets have been taken off most of them, but not all, because we wanted to really, we wanted to look to see what happens long term. The swamp hens have again trampled and damaged some of the plants that are not netted, but there's still a lot of plants that are okay. Carp, again, that's worldwide. You'll have impacts from carp. I know they're native in some places too. Again, design principles. There's one wetland that we did that instead of doing earth banks, we used recycled bricks so that the carp weren't chewing away at the banks because we knew we weren't going to be able to get rid of carp from that system. So then we designed the wetland when it was, um, it was a, a refresh of this wetland because it had been failing, but we had bricks and basically the water plants were then more like hydroponics. Now we're getting near the end, but I wanted to show this picture what happens when you've got like the bathtub type? So this is the wetland that the water would reach its operating level, which was up here. And then when it was too full, it would run down here and then into a pipe. This, is, this means that there was no ability to change the water level anywhere here. So you could only have it deep, deep or nothing. So in essence, like we mentioned, the set and forget, we then had holes drilled throughout this structure and have had PVC pipe and capping put on. Now it's not the best work health and safety, it's not the best anything. It would have been much better to design a drop board structure on the bank so that someone could um, alter the water level in that set and forget method. Anyway, now they can come out and at least open all the caps and leave the water level low or put the caps in and allow the water level to go high. The ability to control water level is so essential. The ability to control water level easily is so essential. These are things we know. Weeds. Um, in the last few moments, I just wanted to go through this um, salt-based urban wetland as well, because many of the coastal areas are looking to reclaim and care for their urban salt wetlands, because particularly with climate change and the potential of sea level rising, we will lose some of these. So as much as we can all learn from each other, the successes of salt marsh and mangrove through creation projects are better. So this is more to let you know that it's a project, you could look out for it. Um, it had the removal of fill 
as you can see going on up here, it's part of the expansion of the container terminal. Uh, the terminal expanded down in this area, but here we've got created a salt marsh with more tidal influence and particularly for the migratory birds. So again, linking so many of our countries on these calls where we have the birds moving from the Northern Hemisphere to the South. That's in progress. This is one of the islands that was created for the birds. Um, why salt marsh is good? We mentioned the crab larvae. Again, this is a global phenomenon. So the more we all work together on these, the more we have um, more resilient ecosystems through what we do. But you can translocate, you know, pick up and move salt marsh. If you've got the levels right, it will work. And that's the key message I wanted to get from this one. And then we do have the habitat for our migratory birds. So this is all constructed salt marsh. These are little birds. Same with mangroves. Sometimes mangrove projects work. Um, sometimes you work things out by trial and error. For example, we had some coir logs that we were using to protect the sediment where the stormwater came out. And I thought, well, I'm going to poke some of these seeds into there to see how they go. They went absolutely marvellous. You can see them down in this picture here. And from that, we worked out that it was the gentle movement of the little seeds that was not allowing them to effectively sit back into the sediment, whereas they would grow when they were in the mangroves because they were able to wedge between the pneumatophores or the roots of the mangroves. So again, observing allows you to do better design. And this was in a small urban pocket. And I'm going to hand back over to swap in there for our final 10 minutes and any questions, but definitely your wetland care does make a difference. And our design, water level control, separating online and offline, correct plants in the correct places, and that ability to manage and maintain are four key elements of the design. And the fifth one is wherever possible, it's for all of us to move away from the concept of it's one design wetland, for example, treating everything at the end point moving back now up into the catchment and having many small places taking in our water and allowing those infiltration places, which also then gives back to the local community in terms of locations for habitat connection maintenance. And on that, I'll hand back to Sultan. Great. Well, Thank you very much, Mia. And I can see the, the sea of um, issues and, and things that you have to plow through. I mean, a little um, wetland in the corner of, of a town or, or a city could have these many issues and factors and things to consider is unbelievable. Um, and in fact, if you get those right, you are doing it okay, you are enjoying, you are fulfilling your objectives. And then if you don't get one or a few right, then it could be a real issue. So on that note, I'll, I'll get back to um, the questions that are coming through. But if I could start, one that I have is, they sound like, you know, fantastic um, natural or constructed naturally functioning systems. But at what point do you see them becoming sort of a, a pain, a liability? Ah, that's like everything in life can be, can be an asset or a liability. We have a lovely brand new car and it breaks and it's a liability. Um, <laughs> it, how do we minimize it becoming a liability? Is one in the good design, which does mean you've got to know the catchment, know your soils, know your water, and have an appropriate expectation from the wetland. If if someone's wanting a wetland that looks like a beautiful pond of clear water, yet it's taking a sediment-laden catchment, it's not going to happen, so you'll call it a failure. But if one was to have that same area of wetland and make it a very densely vegetated marsh, completely fill it as a marsh, allow this dirty sediment water to come and interface with that marsh, and you know it's going to take a certain amount of time before 
that sediment's all captured. And you say, great, the job is done. Now we remove the sediment, put the plants back in, we go again. So one way to have success is to know what you can expect and then design to deliver something that can be realistic within the constraints mm -hmm. you're working in. Right. Well, um, to um, some of the questions, sort of a lot of compliments to start with. Thanks. And um, question on floating wetlands uh, or you know floating rafts. Um, so, what do you think? How are there lots of examples? So that was a question. And how do they function in the experience? Uh, there's yeah. another question, which is about water hyacinth. How comes it, 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 it it's, it's a noxious weed and then it's a problem? Yeah. Yes, 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 good. Floating, floating wetlands, I love them. I think they're fantastic. Uh, I've observed them to be fantastic. I've also observed some liabilities, you know, some problem ones. Um, again, if we're looking at a floating wetland, we can say, what are we able to overcome? We're able to overcome things like, as long as there's still some water in a wetland, the plants then can adapt with where the water water level is. It's not like having plants put on a bank and if there's a really high flow, the banks, is, the water plants are sunk and if it's really low dry times, they're totally exposed. I think as we move forward with cli changing climates, we will see um, a lot more applicability for floating wetlands because they're adaptive. Now, one of the things that happens as an impact on floating wetlands is that they are usually an island because they're quite often in the middle and birds love to sit on them. They will sit on them, they will eat them, they will trample them, they will squash them. So uh, something that I suggested and uh, I've trialled some myself in our pond and it's, it's actually working really well is a sunken floating wetland. So for all you designers out there, a good idea is a sunken floating wetland. So you have it um, mm -hmm. on floats at the edge, but the wetland itself can sit under the water level such that the plants are sticking up, but there's not a place for the birds to sit. If you want to make a place for birds to sit, make a place for birds to sit. If you want a treatment wetland, you make a treatment wetland. So um, yeah. many examples, uh, and of course we can send you links of examples of floating wetlands that work, no problem at all. What a hyacinth, right. yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. what a hyacinth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the description of any weed is a greedy plant. Uh, water hyacinth itself, of course, is a beautiful looking plant, but it's greedy, meaning it takes over all space. When you have a lot of water hyacinth, uh, I can remember being in the, the Delta area in Vietnam, it's, it's just water hyacinth in large areas, huge. Uh, but again, it's, a, it's an organic, it's, it's a nutrient, it, gets, it takes nutrients out, it's able to be composted. So if you have, for example, water hyacinth in a wetland and it's not meant to be there, it's being greedy, it's suppressing the diversity of other species. Yes, some people use herbicide, but then you get a huge organic breakdown and that can cause um, very poor water quality and lack of oxygen in your wetland and kill other things. The other way is mechanical harvesting. And that, yeah. you know, that, is, that seems to be, for big wetlands, mechanical harvesting is the way for smaller ones. You can even have people, again, it's about engaging local communities because even after a big one, you still need someone to go around in a canoe and take out the small pieces as they appear. So management of hyacinth is, is very manual. Uh, if, if, if it's chemical, it really needs to be managed because it can have those side effects. It does, best, yeah. Yeah, best yeah absolutely. Not to sell it. <laughs> absolutely, and also, you know, it can be a, a mosquito mosquito breeding habitat, so in the crevices of those of those leaf stalks, the uh, mosquito breeding happens. So yeah, it's another issue. And there are a number of questions coming from the budget point of view, from community involvement. And there is one, um, how could you size a wetland um, which could predictably um, reduce nutrients coming from the catchment. So, okay. um, yeah. yeah. There's, there's an easy rule of thumb for size. Community and engagement, I absolutely love and more than happy to 
you know, do a follow-up or do something where we really talk about case studies of engaging people long-term and short-term, managing the risks of engagement, et cetera, and uh, really getting that ownership and connection of all ages as well. Because, of course, young ones love it, but how do we engage young ones in wetlands and manage risk, especially with stormwater? We can do it. So we, we, we put yeah. some more together on that. But the sizing, they generally say, this is very general, 3% of the catchment. So if you have 100 hectare catchment, you want a 3 hectare wetland. That's a really base figure. But again, that's the old paradigm where we're saying it's the only thing we've got. So if you have limited area, get more small wetlands, small water infiltration treatment back up into the catchment. And then if you don't have that three hectares available in a 100 hectare area, it, it will be less likely to fail. So that's, yeah, that's the, it's a very rule of thumb. And then of that 3%, you would have an absolute minimum of 30% of that densely vegetated. So these are, yeah. these are very rough, but they tend to be um, they tend to be used, and it's without using music modelling or anything else. It's just again you find wetlands that work, and that's what you'll see if they're smaller than 3%, they really are struggling unless there's catchment yeah. assistance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also along that line, Mia, there is another question I think is, is, is um, on a, a, a scenario in, in developing countries. Says, so how about the use of wetlands as a complementary filtering water system, especially in developing countries? And I know there are many wetlands of, of, of mega sizes in various parts of the world which do a great job. In filtering town order and whatnot. A quick one, absolutely. please. Yeah, absolutely. It's um yeah, because especially in our, you know, around the equator and the monsoonal sort of areas where we do have massive amounts of water, that ability to have the water as part of our drinking and cleaning is essential. It, it just is. The the more plants and the slower you can get the water to move without being stagnant. So that's the key. Have the water moving. As much as possible, make it snake, make it go this, you know, make it go around and around and around through the plants, knowing that the plant's job is to slow and catch the materials. Now, more and more, even for developing countries, we're going to have some of that um, technology available that, that gives you the concentrated ultraviolet light. But for now, have your, have your ability to take out sediment, have your very dense vegetated marsh, and then just after that, totally separate, as we said, use those separation walls to have your open water where you can get as much natural sunshine ultraviolet as possible. And then where you have the ability to pump, take the water from the bottom and put it back through the plants. That's, it, it's the most simple, it copies nature, it does work. It can't yep. promise to make everything perfect, but it's a good system. So sediment out, very dense vegetation, moving through there, not sitting, moving so important. And then you pull with open water with exposure to the sun. But the key thing here is you really want to minimise birds using that particular open water. So it might be that you create an area somewhere else for the birds or something is done to stop the birds at least roosting around there because you don't want the birds cooing in there. So that's a, that is yeah. a consideration when you get the open water. Beautiful. Well, look, and I've got a couple more questions um, coming through, but I'm conscious of the time. And then also I have to make an announcement of the upcoming webinar, which is on the 5th of June. That's the World Environment Day. And Dr. David Rizik, he will be giving a fascinating talk on a you know um, thinking of technology and tools and and moving forward, so it's about uh, conceptual models to support wetland planning and management. How can we employ various clever tools and technologies and things, and then how can we marry them together? So I look forward to and then please uh, keep your eyes um, on the Sydney Olympic Park Authority's webpage over the next week 
will upload it then and then you will be able to register. Um, but uh, before I finish, um, uh, please everybody join me in thanking um, Geraldine and Albi Ball Mia for the um, uh, long presentation. And um, please, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, email through, I will pass to, um, to, to Mia and then we'll, we'll contact you. The, the uh, recording will be available, as I said, I'll email to you when it's ready. But again, thank you very much for joining us and thanks Mia for the presentation. Or any time swapping and also if people have more questions they welcome my email address is on the screen and my linkedin just my name welcome to contact i'm happy to answer things absolutely thank you everybody